Hello. Um, so yes, I'm James Laurie. I'm a, let's see, lead engineer. Yes, lead engineer at uh, New York Times, uh, working with GraphQL. And uh, I'm going to tell you about uh, how we scaled uh, GraphQL. Um, so first, a little background um, on, on what GraphQL looks like at the New York Times. Then I'll go over some basics of caching GraphQL with the CDN. If you were here for the previous talk, there's a little overlap, but I think this is sort of a, a practical application of what Mark Andre was talking about. Um, then I'll be talking about how additional request metadata can affect uh, how you cache GraphQL. Um, finally, I'll talk about how we ensure that our caches are uh, the freshest possible, which is very important for a, a news organization, and how we do active cache and validation. So we've been running, oh, sorry, finally we'll be doing some takeaways uh, at the end. So we've been running GraphQL uh, in production since uh, Q1 of 2017, um, it, so about two and a half years. It started as an experiment, uh, implementing a new home page. Uh, if you're starting with GraphQL now, I wouldn't necessarily recommend choosing your most, your largest application, but uh, that's how we did it, uh, and it worked out okay for us. Um, so this is what a, a GraphQL server uh, instance looks like at the New York Times. Uh, on the left-hand side, you'll see our HTTP interface is written using uh, Finatra and Finagle, uh, which is open source projects from Twitter. Um, then we have a layer of caching of the queries uh, using uh, Caffeine and Redis. In the middle of all that, we have Sangria, which is our Scala-based uh, execution engine. Uh, and then the other side, we also have more caching, or caching uh, each individual response we're getting from our data sources. And then finally, we use Finagle to manage all the networking uh, with our upstream data sources. Um, and this is how GraphQL fits into our front-facing architecture. So again, starting on the left, we have our major clients, our web browser, our Android app, and our iOS app, uh, two of which are using Apollo client. Um, then we have this layer, Fastly. Uh, so Fastly is the CDN, and it's uh, what allows us to deliver uh, fast, reliable, cacheable content to uh, all our users. Um, and we have a config for our website, and we have a config for GraphQL. And then we have the web application, which is serving the HTML pages, connecting to the GraphQL server behind the scenes. And then finally, on the right, we have all our data sources. So some basic stats about uh, our GraphQL uh, stack. Um, we did about 40 billion queries last month. Um, that was 10 terabytes of data received and one and a half petabytes of data uh, served. Our, we have about 70 different uh, clients that are using GraphQL at the New York Times, and our schema is about 500 types and 3,000 fields. So, um, again, if you were at the previous talk, some of this may be a little duplicative, but uh, I'm going to go over sort of the basics of HTTP caching uh, and how it relates to a CDN. Um, so the GraphQL spec itself does not define the transport. Uh, of course, most people are using HTTP uh, with JSON, um, but doesn't actually say how you should do it. Um, and you may not know, but uh, you can actually do GET requests with GraphQL, uh, commonly using POST, but GETs are also possible. So this is what a GET request might look like. Uh, of course, you have your single endpoint for every GraphQL request. You have your query and your query string. You might have variables in your query string, and you might have operation names. Um, but you quickly run into limits using GETs. Uh, so first, uh, the order of your query string can uh, uh, fragment your cache, can affect your cacheability. Um, the order of the, the variables within your query can also affect the cacheability if you're not um, careful about keeping order. Um, and then finally, uh, most systems are going to have a, a limit on the size of the, uh, the GET request, that first line in the HTTP request. Um, in our case, uh, we're using Fastly, and they have an 8K limit, uh, which was not, what, not doable for us. So if we look at the post, uh, 
the post is very similar. Everything is just in the body instead. You still have your single endpoint, um, and most CDMs are not going to work well with post. Uh, but in our case, Fastly does allow you to uh, create a cache key based on the post body. Um, so that is the approach that, that we took. Um, more limitations we ran into. Uh, again, you have to be concerned about the order uh, of the, the query in your body and make sure that you have normalized queries. Um, we also ran into a problem in production where the post body couldn't be gzipped. Uh, if Fastly receives a gzipped request body, it's just going to ignore it, um, which led to some fun production problems that day. <laughs> Um, okay, so how can we solve the problem where, in our case, we have queries which are exceeding the 8K limit, both for get and posts. We have queries that are up to 40K in size. Um, so along comes uh, a protocol that Apollo developed called Automatic, automatic Persisted Queries, um, which basically means that the client is, instead of sending the entire query, going to create a hash of that and send the hash instead. Um, so that's what it's going to look like. Um, and it's going to be a very small post body. It can still be a post. Uh, it could still be a get. You could uh, put the hash right in your query string if you wanted. Uh, but we're continuing to use posts. Uh, so the basic protocol, I won't go into in detail. Uh, there's a great blog post on the Apollo site. You can read about this. Again, the client creates a hash of the query sends that hash to the server. If the server doesn't understand this hash, it's going to send back a specific response, which is going to trigger the client to send the entire query on the next request. Um, and then the server will go ahead and cache uh, that query with that hash and uh, go about its processing. So um, what do I mean by additional request metadata? Um, so in our case, we have certain pieces of information that are not sent along with the GraphQL query. They're coming from request headers, let's say, or cookies or whatnot. And uh, this is when you're talking about personalization and geotargeting. This information is sort of available in metadata, but it's not part of the cache keys we were just talking about in terms of the post body or the, the, the get request line. So where do we use geotargeting at the times? Uh, well, this is, this is the home page. Um, you can see uh, on the bottom there, on the bottom right, left, sorry. <laughs> on the, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yes, all right. Uh, the bottom left, we have what we call our daily briefing. Uh, it's aware uh, that you're uh, in the morning, wherever you are. Let's say you're in New York, so, and it's in the morning, so you get your, your daily briefing. Uh, and then right next to that, knows you're in New York, so you get your, uh, your New York Today briefing. Um, so how, how can we add geotargeting to our, our caching strategy here? Um, we could just, for every single GraphQL request, add that geotargeting metadata. Um, maybe if all your, your whole schema requires geotargeting, that might make sense. Um, but it does fragment your cache. Uh, and for us, only a few things in the, in the schema require that geotargeting information. Um, so instead, uh, we use a strategy uh, using a very header. Um, so there are limits also with very headers. Um, you can only have 200 variations in Fastly based on, based on that single header. Um, in our case, for the geotargeting, things are very targeted. Uh, we have a pretty small set of things of geolocations that we target, uh, so this isn't currently a problem for us. Um, yes. So how does, uh, how does the very header work with Fastly? So this is a diagram of uh, what happens on the initial request response. Um, let's see here. Uh, this is a picture of when Fastly is receiving your initial response from GraphQL. Uh, it gets the cache object. It checks to see if that uh, response has a very header. Uh, if it does, it calculates something called a very key. 
Um, so let's say in this case, uh, the very header says geotarget. That's the name of our request header. And on the request side, that geotarget value was CA, uh, California in this case. Uh, so Fastly is going to go ahead and store that value, California, as its very key. Now, when another request comes in with the same uh, query, the same post body, uh, it's going to look up all the objects that match that in its cache, and it's going to check to see if any of those things have a very key on it. Uh, in this case, it does, uh, but our request has a geotarget of New York, uh, and Fastly sees that, okay, I don't have a very key for New York yet in cache, so it's going to go ahead and send that request on to the origin. So how do we know which GraphQL queries to send very headers back with? Uh, and in our case, we decided we would use schema directives. Um, so schema directives are, in this way, a, a way of sort of annotating uh, what fields uh, in your schema might follow a certain behavior. Uh, this is sort of a simplified version of what the New York Times schema might look like. So you've got a homepage field in that homepage type You've got a list of briefings, and we have our geotargeting geo schema directive uh, indicating that briefings need that geotargeting information. So this is what uh, the process on the server looks like. Um, so first, we receive the HTTP request from our client. We go ahead and parse that into a more domain-specific GraphQL request. And then we analyze the query, looking for all these kinds of directives that might uh, change the behavior of how we send the response back. Uh, so in this case, we see they're querying for the field briefings. It has a geotargeting schema directive. Um, and we, add, we keep those geotargeting variables in our request as we're executing uh, the GraphQL query. And then finally, on the way out, when everything's been calculated, we add that very response header saying, OK, we want to vary on these geotargeting headers. All right, so we do the same thing for personalization uh, in terms of annotating our schema. Uh, for personalization, the use case is a little bit different. We certainly have a lot more than 200 users, so we can't really use very to uh, store a user-specific uh, object in Fastly Cache. Um, but we still use the annotations to let the execution know, engine know that the user cookie needs to be passed along through uh, when we're executing our GraphQL query. So this is the same process we saw before. The only difference is the bottom there. Uh, instead of sending a very header back, we set a cache control no store uh, so that Fastly does not store personalized information. So um, I'm going to go through another use case here where we, we're using the personalized schema directive in sort of a different way. Uh, so breaking news alerts, uh, when the news breaks, uh, the New York Times sends out notifications to all your devices, and the devices think, hey, that's a great time to go fetch all the New York Times content. Um, so what we see is a really huge spike in traffic at those times. Uh, those little notches represent a minute, so we get about a spike of 40 times traffic within a minute, and then it's gone. Um, so how do we deal with that? So uh, in some cases, uh, all those devices are asking for personalized information. And when I say personalized, in this case, it's not like specific user information, it's more like recommendations for that user. So what we do is, uh, in addition to our personalized schema directive, we add a rate limiting filter into our execution chain. Um, so uh, we first check to see if that query has a personalized field. Then next, we check and see if our rate limiter threshold has been breached. Uh, and if it has, we go ahead and remove the personalization context from the request before we execute our GraphQL uh, query. And what that does is it basically all the rest of that uh, machinery kicks in. It sees that there's no personalized information in the request, uh, and it sends back a uh, normal cache control header with a max age of, say, 30 uh, back to Fastly. Uh, and so Fastly will cache sort of a depersonalized version of that query uh, 
for a short amount of time uh, so that we can weather those breaking news alert storms. All right. So uh, as I said, for a news business, having the freshest content in your caches is very important. Um, so we have devised a, a system of active cache invalidation. Uh, so a little background here. Um, as we were adopting GraphQL at the New York Times, we were also completely rewriting our publishing stack. Um, and now a completely event-driven system. And we take advantage of those events to uh, actively invalidate caches throughout the stack. Um, so there's a, a great blog post on the New York Times open blog uh, about how we're using Kafka. I'm just gonna very briefly uh, show a diagram of, of what it kind of looks like. Um, so we have Kafka for our main entity topic that publishers are publishing to. We have consumers that are getting all those published events and creating materialized views as they need. And for GraphQL's purposes, the most important materialized view is this asset data store, which is basically the latest version of each asset uh, that's been published. So what happens after the asset data store uh, stores the latest version of a published asset, it's gonna drop a message on another Kafka topic, uh, Kafka topic uh, just indicating that, okay, I've processed this published entity. Uh, and then we have GraphQL and we have the web application listening for messages on this topic. And so when GraphQL sees that uh, a certain entity has been published or republished, it's gonna go ahead and clear its local caches based on the ID of that published entity. And it's gonna send a message to the Fastly config for GraphQL saying, okay, I wanna purge this entity also. Uh, then it drops a message on that same process topic the web application picks it up, and it in turn invalidates um, its caches for that entity in Fastly. So this is a little bit tricky because uh, if you can think about a GraphQL response, it's gonna be the combination of many, many published entities. So we have our top level article, uh, but maybe it wasn't the article that changed, maybe it was the author's information that changed, maybe it was the caption on the image that changed. Uh, maybe it was the video that changed, or keywords. All these things uh, on, the, on the screen here are all normalized published entities in the system. Uh, likewise, on the home page, uh, we have a home page top level object that actually doesn't change that often, uh, but the top stories, the briefings list, all the various lists uh, which are gonna contain various articles and images, uh, how do we make sure that we can clear the home page when you know, the third image on the fourth article uh, has been changed. Um, so what we do is we take advantage of something that Fastly calls uh, surrogate keys. Uh, I've seen C other CDNs refer to them as cache tags. Uh, basically, they're uh, an alternate way of, of purging items out of cache. You don't have to ca uh, purge items out of cache just based on the sort of primary cache key that you're using. Um, so we wrote some middleware in our GraphQL stack to basically observe uh, the resolution process of the GraphQL query and store the IDs of every single entity that is encountered during that resolution process. Um, and then we drop it in the extensions of our GraphQL response. Um, and then as we're creating our HTTP response, we transform that into a response header. We send that to Fastly. Fastly stores all those tags, all those surrogate keys, along with the cache object. We also pass it along to the web application, which may or may not add its own uh, surrogate keys, and all those surrogate keys also get stored alongside their cache objects in their Fastly config. So go back to a part of that slide before. Again, we have that process topic, which is messages as certain parts of the system are uh, processing these messages. Um, so as GraphQL sees that certain article has been updated, uh, it's gonna purge its caches based on that article's ID, and it's gonna send a purge message to Fastly for that ID. All right, takeaways. So caching with a CDN is possible. Um, 
You've got to know the limitations and plan for them. Uh, be very, uh, it's good to be uh, very knowledgeable about uh, the CDN that you're using. Um, if at all possible, have your clients use GET requests. Uh, most CDNs are going to work with GET requests out of the box. Um, if, uh, if queries exceed the limitations of your CDN, uh, start using hashing, persisted queries. Uh, avoid implicit request metadata if you can. It's much simpler if everything you need to calculate your GraphQL response is in your query itself. Um, but if you can't avoid that, then use very headers uh, if at all possible. And I'm James Laurie, and uh, thank you for coming. And this is Polly. <laughs> okay.